Well, this has been a strange couple of weeks, hasn't it? Uh, like many of you, I am currently working from home other than coming in to preach this message to a couple of camera guys. I have spent most of my week in the spare room of my house. And that means that I have been learning how to do remote meetings with my coworkers. That is a new experience for me and it's very different from the meetings I'm used to having at work. For one thing, I don't normally have a three-year-old standing outside my door screaming things like, mom, dad, do you know how to unbutton my pants? It's also been different for my coworkers as well. They have been showing up to meetings in all sorts of different ways. Uh, for example, uh, one of our campus pastors decided to join us from bed. Apparently that, that's just how they roll in DeKalb, eh, Paul? Uh, and then in another meeting, this little guy showed up just offering a dash of cuteness to our lives. That was pretty wonderful. Um, and it's not just Josh who is on daddy duty. Uh, we also have one of our worship pastors, Brendan, who is uh, taking care of his little girl there. Um, and all of these pictures, you know what they mean? It means I'm the creepy guy who's taking screenshots of my coworkers doing, during Zoom meetings. Of course, I haven't just been cooped up inside. I have also been taking uh, walks around my neighborhood. It's the only way we can get outside. So I've been uh, walking around the block uh, a couple of times a day. And the other day I walked past my neighbor's house and I saw on the sidewalk, they had actually drawn with chalk. They had written jokes on the sidewalk just to cheer people up in the neighborhood. And the best part about it was the kids in the house were actually sitting in the front windows watching to see if people would walk by and laugh at the jokes. And my family did actually laugh at the jokes. So I wanna share some of them with you. Did you hear the joke about the coronavirus? Never mind, I don't want to spread it around. Did you hear that Finland just closed their borders? Yeah, it looks like no one's crossing the finish line today. What do you call it when people are panic buying sausage? The worst case scenario. You get it? Sausage, worst. Since I can't hear you laughing, I'm just going to assume you're just dying. This is amazing. Why do they call it a novel coronavirus. It's a long story. Why are there so many coronavirus jokes? Because it's a pandemic. Why don't chefs like coronavirus jokes? Because they're in bad taste. And maybe they are. I hope you don't think that I'm making light of a serious situation. But sometimes we need laughter to hold on to hope and to keep steady. Because this really is an overwhelming situation, isn't it? So much has happened. And so quickly that uh, every day I, I feel like I, I'm just trying to get my bearings. One day the schools are closed and our kids are at home. Then the stock market has crashed and then we're social distancing and restaurants close and then we're sheltering in place and, and we're learning to work remotely and we're worshiping online. And it seems like everything normal in our lives have been upended just really, really quickly. It's only been a couple of weeks, but it feels like months, doesn't it? And all of this is overwhelming, just the changes to our lives. But that's even before you start thinking about the crisis itself. I, I would rattle off some statistics about the pandemic so that you understand how bad it is, but I'm sure you already know. And talking about that is probably just going to increase your level of anxiety. This is kind of a scary situation. And I want to tell you, if you're afraid these days, it's actually okay to be scared. It's not a sin, believe it or not, to be overwhelmed by a situation, especially one like this. The, the Bible says over and over, do not be afraid. But when it says that, it's not saying it as a command, like do this or else. It's saying it as a comfort. It's saying you don't need to be afraid because God is here and he is not overwhelmed. This is not bigger than him. That he understands what's going on and he is present and he loves you. Do not be afraid. But if you are afraid, God wants us to cast our cares and anxieties on him. Every fear, every nightmare, every worry, he wants us to bring those to him in prayer. A really good way to do that is not just to pray on your own, but to actually ask someone to pray for you. It's great to call up someone and say, hey, this is what's going on. I'm feeling really overwhelmed. Can you pray for me? Hearing that voice actually grounds us and makes us realize we're not alone. If you've got friends that are anxious, this is actually a really wonderful way to show love to them, to, to call them up and just say, hey, how are you doing with all this? Can I pray for you? Now, some of you aren't feeling so much fearful as frustrated by this situation. You're looking at this and you're saying, why are we taking all of these extreme measures? Like, is it really that bad? Is it really worth it? This is so disruptive to life. Why are we doing this? And, and, and I want to tell you what I do when I feel those feelings and I think those thoughts, I remind myself that the reason we're doing all of this stuff 
is not out of fear of the virus, but out of love for our neighbor. Let me say that again. We are not doing this out of fear of the virus, but out of love for our neighbors. This is so important. Think about it this way. If coronavirus were to sweep through Christ Community Church and the same number of people would get coronavirus as got the flu last year, it would mean that we would do 10 funerals for members of our church. And if the numbers are higher, it could be up to 50 or 75. And so when I feel frustrated by the fact that I can't do the things I normally do, And I feel frustrated by the fact that we can't gather together and I cannot hear the voices of my church family as we sing worship songs to God. I just remember how much I love each one of you and it's all worth it. It's all worth it. We're not doing this out of fear. We're doing this out of love for one another. And yes, the measures that we're taking, they're sacrifices, they are losses. But when we sacrifice on behalf of each other, you know what it looks like? It looks like Jesus It looks like the one who loved us enough that when we were vulnerable and at risk, he sacrificed to give us life. And as we go through this fearful and frustrating time, that's what I want us to hold on to, to hold on to Jesus, the source and the center of our lives. And that's actually what our passage is about today. So as we turn to that, let me pray for us. God, we pray that right now, as we open up your word, that you would take our fear and replace it with peace that you would take our frustration and that you would fill us instead with sacrificial love for one another and for our neighbors. God, we pray that you would keep us rooted in Christ, that we would be standing firm on the foundation of what he has done and who he is. God, we pray that as we open up your word right now, that we would see Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, this is the fourth week in our series in the New Testament book of Colossians. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Colossians chapter two. Uh, We're going to be in Colossians two in verse six. And the major theme of the book of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ. The, The book could be summarized like this. Christ is higher, better, greater, stronger than anything else. And in a time when it feels like we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on, And even the most powerful people in institutions don't seem to be in control. It is very comforting to hear words like are in chapter one that say this. In him, all all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Christ is above all. And that is supposed to motivate us to make him the center of our lives. We're supposed to organize our lives around him. And that's where the passage we're looking at today starts in verse six. It says this, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Let's thank God for speaking to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here's the main command in this section of scripture. Continue to live your lives in him. Live your life in Christ. Notice that it doesn't say, get a little of Christ into your life. It says, live your life in Christ. Not make sure that Christ has some place in your world somewhere, but fit your life into his world. See, everybody, no matter who they are, has something that they build their lives around. Something that is at the center and everything else in their life orbits around it. How do you know what's at the center of your life? It's by asking questions like this. Where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my money? What what gets the best of my attention and energy? What relationships do I prioritize? And as you answer those questions, you'll start to see, this is what I'm building my life around. And Paul is urging us, he is saying, put Christ at the center of your life and build everything else around that. Because there are a lot of other things who are vying for that central place. Your career, your romantic relationships, your politics, your finances, your fitness, your your family's success and safety, your entertainment, your comfort. They're all trying to be that central thing that you live for. But here's the thing I want you to notice about all of those things. Every one of them is actually a good thing. There is nothing wrong with money or romance or entertainment. Believe it or not, there's actually nothing wrong with politics either. It's a good thing. The, The problem is when one of those things becomes the central thing. It takes that place at the heart of your life. And when that happens, what ends up happening is when there is a decision, a competition between Christ and that thing, Christ loses. Say you're dating someone 
who you know is not a committed follower of Christ. And yet you don't want to break up with them because that relationship is more central than Jesus is in your life. That you're working 60 hours plus a week and yet you have no time to pray with your spouse or your children. It may be that your career is more central than Jesus in your life. When you look at your budget, you're, you're not sure you can give up your subscription to Netflix or Disney Plus, but you still struggle to give financially to the church or to anybody else. Maybe your comfort and your entertainment are at the center rather than Jesus. Maybe you're so invested in your political views, whether they are on the left or the right or the center, that you can't worship with people on the other side of the spectrum. Maybe your politics have, has become more central than Jesus. And again, none of these things in and of themselves are bad things, but they cannot be the organizing center of your life. That place is for Christ alone. And in the rest of the passage, what Paul does is he gives four reasons why Christ needs to be at that center, central place. Here's the first reason. Because in Christ, you lack nothing. In Christ, you lack nothing. Look at verse nine. It says, for in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. In Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. You cannot find a stronger statement of the divinity of Christ than this one. It is saying Jesus is God. And think about what that means. Think about what that means. It means that he is the creator and ruler of all there is. He made it. He owns it. He knows it all. He can do it all. There is nothing that Jesus needs. There's nothing that he lacks. There's nothing that he wants, but he cannot have. Because he is the source of everything that anybody could possibly want. He is the source of all life. There's not a breath that has ever been breathed that didn't come from him. He is the source of all love. He, he and the Father and the Spirit live for all eternity in a relationship of perfect, unending love. And every human connection is but a reflection of that. He, he is the source of all joy. Jesus is the one who invented pleasure and he is in fact the happiest being there ever was. He is the source of all power and all beauty and all justice and all peace. Everything that makes life worth living, it comes from him. He is the source of it all. But then Paul goes on to say this in verse 10. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. If you have put your trust in Christ, it means you have been united with Jesus. And that means that he shares all that belongs to him with you. He says, as God, I have enough to meet your every need. And since you are in me, it is all yours. You lack nothing that you need. And here's why this matters. Because the reason we go looking for other things to build our lives around is because they are promising to meet our needs. So, so we go looking. This is the motivation for so much of our behavior. We, we assume that Jesus isn't going to be enough. So we look for something else. What if I don't have enough love? I, I go looking for a person to make me feel like I'm perfectly accepted and adored. If I feel like I, I'm missing out on something, like there's something I should be doing or could be doing, I, I fill my schedule and my family's schedule with more and more stuff to do. If I feel like I don't have enough peace, I'm not getting enough peace, I take another hit of my addiction of choice to numb the pain. Every sin is rooted in this underlying belief that I need something else, something more than Jesus to meet my needs. It's the reason why Eve took the apple in the garden. Having God was not enough. She needed to grab hold of something else that would satisfy her. When Jesus doesn't seem like enough, we go looking for something that he made rather than the maker himself. How does that work out for us? Not well at all. Because even when we turn to good things, those things are limited. They cannot deliver on the promises that they make. They're always demanding more and more from us and giving us less and less until they demand everything and give us nothing. And all the while, we could be going to the source because in Christ, you lack nothing. Here's the second reason to make Christ the center of your life. Because in Christ, you have been made alive. In Christ, you have been made alive. Let me read in verse 11. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Now there is a ton in these verses. 
And there's no way I can explain it all right now. For example, uh, circumcision comes up four times in these verses. Uh, That is a very important thing to understand, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip it. Also, I know that some of you are sitting there with your children and you would not appreciate the conversations that it generates if I actually go into depth about what circumcision means. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm actually going to post a video of me explaining circumcision online later this week uh, for those of you who are overachievers and just want to get a little bit more information. But for now, I'll just explain it this way. Prior to Jesus showing up, circumcision was the way the people of God were marked as belonging to God. So every Jewish male was circumcised and every adult convert, every male adult convert to Judaism was circumcised. Once Jesus came, that symbol of who belonged to the people of God was changed from circumcision to baptism. Now that is the symbol that marks those who belong. Now, first thing I want you to notice in this passage about baptism is that Paul assumes that everyone, everyone who is a follower of Christ has been baptized. He he just writes the letter assuming, well, of course you've been baptized. And he does that in other places in the New Testament. Why would he do that? Because in the early church, people got baptized right away. They, They didn't wait for years to do it. They took the first available chance to get baptized. It was the first act of obedience that was expected for a new follower of Christ. If that's you, if you have not been baptized yet, even though you've surrendered to Christ, make this a priority. The the next time we announce baptisms, which I I don't know the exact date given the current situation when we're going to do that, but we do it a few times a year. Make sure that when that happens, you get baptized. The other thing I want you to see about baptism is what baptism symbolizes. It symbolizes the death of your old life and the beginning of a new life in Christ. Look at what it says in verse 12. It says that you have been buried with him in baptism. That's what going down into the water symbolizes. And then it says later on, it says you have been raised with him. You've been raised with him. That's what coming up out of the water symbolizes. Verse 13 sums it up this way. It says, God made you alive with Christ. You were dead, but you are are made alive in Christ. Baptism is this symbol of a miracle that God has worked in our hearts. Uh, Our hearts are just broken and busted. They do not work the way they are meant to work. Think about it this way. Uh, The root of most of our problems is the fact that we want things that we shouldn't want or that we don't want things that we should want. We know what this means when it comes to physical health, right? Like I should want vegetables and exercise and going to sleep at a reasonable hour. That would make me healthy. My problem is that what I actually want is a Portillo's cake shake, hitting the snooze button one more time and watching another episode of Star Trek Picard. At a spiritual level, the same thing happens. I should want peace with my wife, but what I really want is to prove that I'm right and win the argument. What I should want is the best decision for the team that I'm on, but what I really want is to protect my turf and keep control. What I should want are open, authentic relationships, but what I really want is to impress others and make them think that I'm, I'm pretty incredible. What I should want is to honor other people above myself, but what I really want is the satisfaction of sharing a juicy piece of gossip. And this is what creates the problems. Our busted hearts lead to busted lives and busted relationships and a busted world. And we do all sorts of things to try to fix this. We try self-help strategies, organizational systems, fitness routines, life hacks, all just to change ourselves, to try to fix ourselves. Sometimes people will even just try to change their environment. They'll, they'll uh, quit their job and start a new one, or they'll change churches, or they'll move across the country, or, or they'll get a divorce, all in the hopes that if they're in a different situation, different relationships, then they'll act differently. But it doesn't work. We can redirect our sinful desires, but none of these things actually change them. And this is what's so different about Jesus. When we surrender to Christ, it's not just a change out here. It's a change in here. We, we aren't just in Christ. Christ is actually in us by the Holy Spirit. Uh, last week, we read the passage that describes it this way. If Christ is in you, that is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. In Christ, our old sinful selves are buried and our hearts are raised to new life to be like Jesus. In Christ, you are made alive. The third reason to make Christ the center of your life is because in Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are forgiven. Look again at verse 13. Says this, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, 
which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. There, there are two great needs that the human heart has. One is to be known and the other to be loved. We need both of those things, but unfortunately, it seems like we've got to pick between them. Because I think about it, if someone really knew me, like the real me, what I'm really like, what I think and what I feel and how I act, if someone really knew me, I'm not sure they would love me. And when people love me, uh, it's because I'm hiding some from, something from them. They don't see the full truth about me. And because of this, this is the reason why so many of us are faking our way through lives, our, our lives, try, trying not to be found out for who we really are. This is the reason why so many of us are burning ourselves out, trying to prove that we are actually lovable. This is why so many of us demand so much out of our relationships, because we want our friends and our parents and our significant others to make us feel like we are, are okay, like we're worthy of love, because we want to be known and loved, but we're afraid we can't get both. Uh, underneath it all, though, is this deep shame that nothing can seem to take away. But look at what Christ has done. Verse 14 says, he canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. The charge of our legal indebtedness, that is a mouthful, but it's Paul using an image of an IOU. He's saying there's a document that spells out what we owe to God. Think of it like if you went to a hotel. You go to a hotel and you think you're just having fun, having a good time, and uh, you show up in the morning to check out and they hand you a list of all of the charges that are being accrued to your account. So every snack you took out of the mini bar and all the room service you ordered and every movie that you watched and, and, and the uh, bathrobe that you stole and the lamp that you broke and the graffiti on the ice machine, all of it is on the list because you owe for that. It's your charge of legal indebtedness. Now imagine the equivalent of that at the end of your life. What would it be like to see an itemized bill for what your life actually cost? The, the damage caused by every unkind word, the, the cost of every broken promise, the, the cost of your defensiveness and your passive aggressive behavior, the, the cost of a lifetime of treating people like objects or, or servants for your needs, the, the cost of your lies and your lust and your apathy of your overconsumption and your stinginess, the cost of your cowardice and your anger, the cost of your rebellion against the one who made you. Th think of the damage that it did to your relationships and to the world and to your soul. Think of the damage your behavior has done to the reputation of God. What if all of that was written out, all of it, so someone could read it and they could read this charge against you and you would be fully known when they read that. They would see the true you. How would you deal with the shame of that? Ironically, the way most of us deal with shame is actually by turning to the source of our shame. We're ashamed about our temper and, and what it does to other people. And we wish that we were different, but when we're confronted about it, we just blow up in defensiveness rather than face the shame. We feel shame about using porn, but we turn to porn to numb the shame. We feel ashamed about our drinking, but we would rather drink and actually deal with the underlying root shame. How, how do you break that cycle? Well, look at the end of verse 14 again. Look at what Jesus has done with that list of charges against us. It says, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to the cross. Think about what that means. It means the one who knows the full extent of our sin, the one who knows our sin so well that he could actually write a list of all of it, Instead of condemning us, instead of punishing us, he takes the list in his hand and he nails it to the cross. He says, this is the debt that you could not pay, but I will pay it for you. This is the shame that you could not bear, but I will bear it for you. Why would he choose to do that? Because he absolutely loves you. This is what Christ can offer that nothing else can. The, the true solution to your shame is this. In Christ, you are fully known and fully loved. In Christ, you are forgiven. Here's the final reason Paul gives for why you should center your life on Christ. Because in Christ, you have victory. In Christ, you have victory. Uh, this past Wednesday was March 25th. Do you know what March 25th is? It's obvious, I know everybody's thinking of the same thing. March 25th is the day that Frodo destroyed the One Ring in the fires of Mount Doom, obviously. 
uh, Tolkien, uh, he decided in his great epic, The Lord of the Rings, that March 25th would be the day that evil was finally defeated. And you know why Tolkien picked that date? It's because that date is the traditional day the church celebrated the conception of Jesus, the day that God became incarnate. Think about it for a second. We celebrate Jesus's birthday on December 25th, nine months earlier on March 25th, an angel was announcing to a young virgin that she was pregnant. So Tolkien, who is a dedicated, devout Christ follower, saw this as a day when the power of evil was broken. He said, when the son of God came into the world to, to destroy the works of the devil, that was the day that, that evil was destroyed. That was the death blow for that. How did Jesus actually accomplish this? Now let's look at what he did in his life to defeat evil in verse 15. It says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross triumphing over them by the cross. When Paul talks about the powers and authorities, he is talking about the forces of evil that are behind the scenes manipulating the systems and cultures of our world. These are the forces that, that have been at war with God and his people from the very beginning. And what Paul is saying here is that on the cross, Jesus decisively won that war. That, that was the, the death blow there. Jesus stripped the powers of evil of their weapons. He triumphed over them. He made a public spectacle out of them. In the Roman world, a, a public spectacle is a very specific thing. It was when a general had conquered uh, an enemy and they would take their enemy and parade them through the street. They would uh, strip them down of their, their, uh, their, their armor and their weapons. They would walk them through the street and everybody would mock them and they would take them to the center of town and they would execute them. And so that's what Paul is saying. This is what Jesus did on the cross to the forces of evil. He conquered them completely. Now, of course, this actually sounds kind of absurd when you actually look at what the cross is. The cross actually looks like the exact opposite of what Paul is describing. On the cross, Jesus was the one who was stripped. He was the one who was paraded through the streets. He was the one who was mocked. He was the one who was executed for all the world to see. On the cross, it sure looked like Jesus was the one being defeated, not the other way around. This does not look like a victory. And yet at that moment, what looked like utter defeat for God was actually God's greatest victory. The, the other day, someone asked me if I thought that the devil was using coronavirus to attack the church. And I thought about it and I, I had to agree with him when he said, it feels like the devil is getting what he wants. I mean, what could the devil want more than to see God's people scattered? He, the devil hates it when we get together for worship. He hates it when people from different backgrounds and walks of life come together and join our voices to declare the praise of God and to hear God's truth. He hates it when we welcome each other and we love each other, when we lay hands on each other and pray for each other. Every single weekend when we get together at our four campuses, the devil is furious about it. And so of course he wants to stop that. But more than that, the devil wants us isolated. He wants us afraid. He, he wants us suffering and dying. He, he wants to steal the breath out of our lungs and the hope out of our hearts. That the devil came to steal and kill and destroy. That's what he's there for. And it sure looks like coronavirus is working towards those plans, don't you think? It looks like the devil is winning on this one. But this is where Jesus always gets the last laugh. Jesus is the master of making what looks like a defeat into a victory. When you read the book of Acts, it happens all the time, again and again. When the Christians in Jerusalem are scattered because of persecution, it only leads to the gospel going to new cities and new places. When Paul and Silas are thrown into a dungeon at midnight, they start singing songs and worshiping in front of everybody. And the prison guard and his family overhear it and they end up coming to faith. When Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, every time he is put on trial, he uses it as a chance to tell his story of faith to every Roman judge and every governor and ultimately to Caesar himself. These were genuinely horrible situations. Everything was falling apart and lives were on the line. These were not good situations. And yet, as followers of Jesus, the early Christians knew that the truth that Christ had already defeated the forces of evil was true, whether it looked like it or not. He had already disarmed them. And that means even when it looks like the devil has the upper hand, God is always using what he intended for harm for God's good purposes. And if we hold on to that, it changes how we view moments like this one that we're in. The other day, I saw a video online of a woman who was in her apartment 
and there was an alarm, a car alarm blaring outside her window. It was so obnoxious, going on and on and on, and it wouldn't stop. Now, it was, it was a, a, an annoying situation, enough to drive someone nuts, but this woman heard it as something different. She was a, a musician, and so she des- decided to transform the situation using her, her ability at music. This is what she does. Make sure you listen carefully as she does it. I think that this is a parable of how Christians ought to respond in situations like this. Uh, Obviously, the coronavirus is far more serious than a car alarm. It's not just an annoyance. It's a matter of life and death. But the principle is the same here. We need to take situations that are disruptive, a situation that is painful, a situation that we do not have the power to stop and ask the question, what might God do through me to turn this into a moment of beauty and grace? How might he use us to transform what's going on here, to win good out of evil? Now, I'll tell you this. I'm not sure how to fully answer that question right now. This situation is so new. But I do want to share just a few observations that I've made of places where maybe God is at work doing something new, doing something different through this. And maybe it'll spark thoughts even for you. I think about my neighborhood. I mentioned before that I'd been taking walks through the neighborhood. Guess what? So is everybody else. And everybody is at home right now. That's not even something that happens on the weekends in my neighborhood. Everybody, as we walk by, are calling out of their windows or waving from their garages. And I've had so many conversations with neighbors just across our yards. We can't get close to each other, but we're still connecting, uh, even in ways that we might not have because we're always on the go. But I, I I wonder in a year when we've been talking about how do we love our neighbors well, what God might be doing with that situation. Uh, What about being stuck at home with your family? Has it been hard for you? I'm guessing it has. It's stressful for everybody to be together all the time. But I wonder if there's an opportunity there. I wonder if the fact that we're all together all the time means that for those of us who are always going, 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 we've got so many activities that we're actually sitting down and eating meals together and having conversations and making memories that we wouldn't have had otherwise. It might even be a place where relationships that you have neglected that you need to mend, that you haven't dealt with yet, you're being forced to interact and this is your opportunity to actually heal those relationships. But what about worshiping at home? For, for some of you, this is so weird. You're singing along to songs and you, the only other voice you hear around you is someone in your family or your roommate and you're, you're like, this is not something I normally do. But it's actually kind of incredible because it might actually be forcing us to do something that would have been good for us all along. To actually worship in our homes with the people that we do life with. That that actually now you've broken the ice and you can actually bring that into the place where you live, not just out there when you're at church. What about you parents doing Kids World at home? Have you tried it yet? Uh, For some of you, this is the first time, this is the first time you've ever had spiritual conversations with your kids. And I hope it won't be the last. It whets your appetite for that. Uh, I think about how this has made all of us, all of us long for in-person face-to-face connections with people. I wonder if when we get through all of this, that our desire for community will remain strong. Maybe it'll make us seek out the relationships we always should have been prioritizing in the first place. And maybe it'll make it so that we take for granted less the fact that we can actually be in community with one another. Even the fact that we have to be uh, distant from each other, that we're making choices about social distancing, it actually helps us learn how to love better, doesn't it? I mean, remember, the reason we're doing all of this is not out of fear, but out of love for our neighbors. And so all of these practices are helping us learn how to make decisions saying, how do my actions actually affect other people? How can I look out for the good of other people, not just my own good, even if it's inconvenient or sacrificial for me? And of course, there's the way that a crisis like this, like all crises, open up the deeper questions about life. The the truth is this, COVID-19 has not increased the death rate for humanity. It has always been at 100%. What COVID-19 has done is open our eyes to the truth that has always been there, that we are small, frail, mortal creatures. It's also shown us that our governments and institutions and the systems that we look at are so strong are not actually omnipotent. They're they're not in control. 
It's shown us how the things that we've trusted in our lives to be stable, to save us, uh, our health, our money, our, our normal routines and lifestyle, those are actually fragile and they cannot protect us. What we need is something bigger than what we have. We need a savior. We need a rescuer. We need Christ at the center of our lives because nothing else is sufficient. And it's waking us up to realize that. In the coming weeks and months, I I don't know what this is going to look like. I'm pretty sure it's going to get worse before it gets better. And and I'm certain that it's going to open up ways for us to show the love of Christ through sacrificial service to other people in ways we maybe didn't anticipate and didn't expect. And my hope is this, that when our neighbors are in need, when our world is looking for answers, that we would be the ones there to offer it. Uh, Maybe you've seen that Mr. Rogers quote that's online everywhere right now, where he says this, he says, when I was a boy, I used to see scary things in the news. And my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll, You'll always find people who are helping. Wouldn't it be great if when people looked for the helpers, they saw Christians? I think that's the way that Jesus will defeat the devil in this situation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need you. We need you to hold our fears and our frustrations. We need you to be the one who carries us through this. Jesus, we want you to be at the center of our lives. Nothing else is sufficient. God, we pray that you would show us the ways that we have been building our lives around other things. And we pray that you would help us put you right there in the middle, that we would build everything around that and even make the hard decisions because in you is everything that we need and we lack nothing. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move in us, that you would take the words that we've studied in the the book that you inspired, that you would use them to transform us and make us more and more like Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.